So how many of you know what happened on May 25th of this year? Yes, figure this crowd would. Uh, GDPR took effect. Uh, and how many of you were engaged in a, or your organizations were engaged in a mad scramble <laughs> at that time? Yeah, pretty much, I know we were. Uh, and how many of you are confident that you are all in compliance with GDPR? Oh, we got one. That's good. <laughs> Do you want to come give the? <laughs> okay. So my name is Kyle Gupton. Uh, I'm a director of product management at Tableau in our developer team. Um, and I work with our customers primarily in public sector, healthcare, and financial services to make sure we understand uh, the needs of customers in those unique markets that tend to be highly regulated, which means I also end up working with a lot of legal stuff, which is why I kind of got involved in our GDPR effort. Um, and so today I'm going to be basically talking about how you can stay on the right side of GDPR when you're using Tableau to analyze personal data. It's meant to be a pretty practical presentation. I'm going to start by covering the basics. Oops. There we go. Start by covering the basics of GDPR so we all have a common footing on terminology and so forth. And then I'm going to get into how you actually use um, how you or how you can fulfill your responsibilities um, that you have when you're working with people's personal data. Um, because I want to check my assumption. Uh, are people in here or your companies you're basically collecting data for people and then you're analyzing it and storing it and stuff like that? Yeah, that's that's what I figure. Um, and so it's going to be a pretty practical um, pretty practical talk about where data ends up in the Tableau platform so you can keep track of it and security best practices and things like that. Okay, so few disclaimers. I am not an attorney. I kind of like legal stuff and that's why I get involved in this, but I'm not an attorney. Um, and interpretations of GDPR vary widely. There's a lot of stuff out there telling you what you have to do and everything to be compliant with GDPR. And a lot of it is just interpretation. The law, which is large and sweeping, is 88 pages in English. And a lot of the things that people talk about, like things like the right to erasure, is like half a page to one page. There are no technical standards that are part of GDPR. There's no technical guidance. And so when people are saying that, oh, well, you have to do this, and you have to store things this way, and you have to encrypt, that's not part of GDPR. That's someone's interpretation of perhaps best practices for complying, but it's not part of GDPR. And what I'm going to be presenting today is based on our being Tableau's understanding of GDPR. Um, we have our own legal team and we worked with outside counsel to develop an understanding of what we were gonna do about GDPR because we're subject to it because we do business with people in the European economic area. Um, and we you know, have a number of different places where GDPR is relevant to us. You know, a big part of it is we collect data from all of you. So we have databases that, you know, have a lot of information about our customers, uh, sales databases, things like credit card numbers, uh, and all of that that we keep a hold of. Um, and so, you know, that's subject to the GDPR for individuals uh, in Europe. Um, we also, uh, through our cloud product, Tableau Online, store data on behalf of our customers, and that data can contain personal data for their customers. And so that makes us have certain responsibilities under the GDPR. And so we developed our own perspective, and I'm going to be sharing kind of basically, assume that the tone that I'm giving you is Tableau's perspective. And we do expect that perspective to change over time. Um, GDPR is new. There's not really a court record or you know, legal findings or anything like that yet. And so the landscape is going to change over time um, as there are you know, court cases and decisions made, it will become clearer what the best practices are. And I know one of the things that I kind of anticipate having um, is that there will eventually be technical standards that start to emerge from this. Um, you know, kind of perhaps a consortium of industry and European regulators will start to produce um, more technical guidance so that people can have a, a more concrete set of goals. Um, that's what's happened in the U.S., for example, with the HIPAA law for patient data privacy. You know, the original law was a very high-level law that said you have to keep it private. And then we got something called the HIPAA security rule, 
um, that is a further elaboration from a technical point of view of what that means. And then we have something called high trust, which is in development, which is a industry-wide set of security best practices to say, you know, if you do this, then you're, you're on the right side of the spirit of HIPAA and you have a concrete thing. And I, I expect things like that will happen um, with GDPR. But for now, um, we're sharing our best guess as to um, how it's interpreted uh, and a good way to interpret it. Uh, last two things uh, on the disclaimer is, one, this is not legal advice, and I do encourage you to work with the appropriate legal professionals, uh, both within your own, mainly within your own organizations, to figure out what your stance is. Um, and it doesn't have to be our stance. It can be different than our stance. So let's start with the basics. So GDPR is, a, is the General Data Protection Regulation. It's a law in the European Union that uh, basically strengthens, and uni strengthens personal privacy rights and unifies their privacy regulations. So the EU has had data privacy laws for some time, and what they did basically was they created a new law which superseded the old laws. They repealed the old laws and passed this new one um, that is kind of all the old laws plus more. Uh, and it covers a variety of things. It establishes um, rights for individuals and responsibilities for people who control the personal data of individuals. Um, and it is basically, it applies to all organizations that are doing business or interacting with someone in the European economic area, which is the EU plus Norway, Liechtenstein, and Iceland. Um, and it basically, if someone is in the EU and you're dealing with their data, then it is, you are subject to the GDPR. Uh, you don't have to, the person doesn't have to be a European citizen or like permanent resident or anything like that. It's literally their presence in the EEA. Okay, so like I said, it specifies a number of, of rights and responsibilities. So rights for individuals, actual people, um, and responsibilities for organizations who collect and process their data, um, and specifically personal data. So personal data is, you know, kind of obvious ones are things like someone's name, email address, phone number, driver's license number, um, whatever an equivalent might be to like a social security number, you know, government IDs, those sorts of things. Um, and there are some other ways that you can talk about personal data that are a little more um, indirect, and I'll talk about that in a second. So there are a number of key elements of the GDPR. Um, strengthen personal privacy rights is the big one. Uh, it's what we hear about. But increased responsibility um, on protection of personal data is, you know, I don't know if I would say it's the most important part, but I know that you know, things like right to erasure and stuff like that get a lot of the press in terms of, oh, you have to be able to delete someone's data, and people talk a lot about that. But probably the most risky part is you've got to keep their data secure. And I know when I was working with our legal team, you know, for them, the most important thing to us as a company was making sure that all of your data as customers doesn't get out into the wild, and even more importantly, that if you're storing data in Tableau Online, that that stays secure. Um, that that's like the thing that we're like is the biggest risk for us um, are those things. You know, we've gotten a couple of requests for people exercising their rights, but that's been very minor compared to, you know, our responsibility to keep data secure. Um, so there are things like mandatory reporting for breaches of personal data. So you can't, you know, like some people recently have a breach and then not talk about it <laughs> and kind of hide it. Uh, you can't do that. Um, and there's other things like rules for transfer of personal data outside of the EU. Um, and then, of course, like I mentioned with the right to erasure, the right of an individual to ask a company, for example, to remove their data from their systems. So a little more definition about what these things mean, because I'm going to use some terms. So these are, please don't try to read it. <laughs> this is actually text from the law, <laughs> from the English uh, version of the law. So basically, personal data is, first of all, information about an actual person. You know, it's not about a company. It's not about, it's an actual real human being. Um, and it's information that can be used to directly or indirectly identify them. So direct stuff is like, you know, ID numbers, like driver's license or email address or name. Indirect stuff might be like a collection of characteristics that clearly describe only one person. 
So like, for example, um, you know, my home address, my gender and my race pretty much clearly identifies who I am. You know, you don't have to have my name affiliated with it. You know, it's like, oh yeah, that's Kyle. Um, so that can be personal data as well in a collection. So a controller then is an organization of some sort or an individual who basically collects personal data from individuals and then decides how it's used. So that is um, what a controller is. So for example, um, in our marketing and sales databases, like I said, we have data on our customers. In that case, we are the controller of that data. And so that's what that means. Another term that is used is processing. And so processing is the actual activities related to the data, like how you collect it, how you store it, how you transmit it, all of those kinds of actual activities. That's processing. And then th there are what are called processors, processors who are people who process, or organizations who process data on behalf of a controller. So for an example here is if you have personal data that you are storing in Tableau Online as like say data extracts in Tableau Online, you're the controller but we're the processor. And we have responsibilities as the processor of that data because we are storing it. Okay, clear as mud? All right, so this is hopefully, this is the last slide I have with a big block of text. Um, it was really hard making this presentation and not having it just be all text. So I've tried, <laughs> you know, get to talk about legal stuff and be like, oh, how do I make a cool image <laughs> you know, about legal stuff? That's kind of hard. So I've tried um, and I'll show you. <laughs> okay, so fulfilling your GDPR responsibilities. So that's basically what this talk is about now that we've gotten past the basics is you have responsibilities as the holder of people's personal data and you need to be able to fulfill them. And so I'm gonna be talking about how to fulfill the ones that relate specifically to your use of Tableau. There are other responsibilities you have that I'm not gonna talk about, um, and they are probably things that the people in you all don't have to worry about. Things like, you know, what is an appropriate uh, privacy policy for your organization? You know, what is the um, way that someone consents to share their personal data with you? Um, those are all responsibilities because, you know, there are uh, parts of the GDPR that talk about, you know, when you ask someone for their personal data and tell you how you're, they're gonna use it, it needs to be in kind of plain language. It can't be in legal jargon. So those are responsibilities as well. I'm not gonna talk about that stuff anymore. And again, like I just mentioned, um, responsibilities, depending on what products you're using, might be shared between you and, and us. Again, that's relevant specifically for Tableau Online, where we are storing your data, or potentially storing your data. Okay, so in terms of the financial, or sorry, in terms of the responsibilities, there are basically kind of four steps that you kind of have to go through, four things that you need to do. Uh, and this is kind of a boiled down, you know, all right, what's an what's a outline of a best practice of how you can go about doing this? Uh, first thing is identifying it, knowing where it is. Second, making sure it's secure. Third, governing access to it. And finally, being able to facilitate the rights that data subjects might exercise. And a data subject, by the way, is the person, is the actual identified person, the, the individual. So let's talk about identification, because that's kind of the, the, the real first step is you need to know what personal data you have and where it is, because you can't control it, you can't keep it secure, you can't delete it and all those things if you don't know where it is. And that's actually a pretty challenging thing to do, is find out where everything is. And it's gonna be really interesting, this is one of those vague areas, it's gonna be really interesting to see, like, how far does it go? You know, in, when things are decided in court, you know, how far does it go? You know, because people say things like, oh, if you have, you know, data in a database, any backup tapes, any of that sort of thing has to be in there. And some of that just becomes, like, how, how do you do that? You know, how, how do you actually track that and, and do it in a practical way? So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how this develops over time. So in Tableau, however, it's, you need to understand kind of where personal data can be. And there are two broad categories of personal data that can end up inside of Tableau. And by that I mean in desktop, server, online, uh, and so forth. So first is obviously, um, and the biggest source of it is 
data sources. So these are your databases, your files, Excel files, CSV files, and so, so forth that can contain personal data. And then there's also personal data that can be stored as part of user accounts on Tableau Server and Tableau Online um, and Tableau Public. Um, and so there's a lot of talk about how important that aspect is um, because it's like, you know, your company has a you know, user account for you on Tableau Server. And yeah, your personal data is there, but it's really not that much. You know, it's some activity logs, you know, name, email address, but it's stuff that the company kind of already has. Um, but I do want to be complete and talk about this because people do bring it up. You know, especially I've gotten lots of questions from our German customers about this because they are really on this subject and had very strict rules about it um, before GDPR. Okay, so personal data in data sources. So you have pointed Tableau at a data source and started analyzing data from that data source. Um, so first thing to know is you need to figure out what the personal data is. And there are lots of ways that you can find this personal data. Um, you can look through your databases. You can use data cataloging software that allows you to affiliate metadata um, and say, ah, this column in a database contains personal data so that you can find it and so forth. Um, in Tableau, right now at least, the best way to find what might be personal data is to search your fields for names, you know, that have names that are obviously like, you know, name, you know, email address, things like that, phone number. Um, we are working, uh, I can't talk too much about it, but we are working on better ways to be able to tag and uh, affiliate metadata with fields and so forth so that you can do this sort of thing uh, in a more structured way. Um, and then there's another thing that's coming up that um, I wanna mention. Uh, we talked in the opening keynote about our increased relationship with Amazon AWS. So one of the tools that they've uh, recently been developing is something called Macy. Um, M-A-C-I-E, and what it is, is it is a AI-based tool for scanning data that is stored in Amazon S3 cloud storage. And it basically can go through and can basically, you just dump stuff in there, databases, files, whatever, and it can go through and basically alert you to say, it's like, okay, we think we found this stuff here that qualifies as personal data, and it's an AI learning algorithm, so it can, you can kind of train it to make it better. Um, and so we're looking to do kind of an integration with that. So you know, if you store all of your you know, Tableau data sources in an S3 store, maybe you have hyper extracts in there, it'll be able to crawl that and identify to you um, what might be personal data. So this is kind of a task that ultimately is gonna have to be done by computers, I think, because it's just not practical for people to go trace down all of this stuff. Um, there's gonna need to be automated tools and those kinds of things are under development with tools like Macy at AWS and we look to integrate with them so you can have a good flow of uh, understanding what personal data is, has touched Tableau at some point. Okay, so now you know that you know, you've got personal data in Tableau, now where can that data end up once you've hooked up Tableau to it? And it can end up in some surprising places. So I wanna go through and kinda of talk about what all those are. So first, um, there are extracts and exports. So if you create an extract of your data source and that data source has personal data in it, then you've created a copy of the personal data in the extract. So that's one place it can end up. Second is if you export that data into a CSV file, and that data, again, has personal data in it, you've created a copy of it. You need to be able to keep track of that. Um, Tableau prep, when you run a Tableau prep flow, it, the output of a Tableau prep flow is either an extract or a CSV file. And if personal data makes its way through that flow, then you've created a copy at that point. Another place that personal data can end up are in all of the packaged files that Tableau can create. So a packaged workbook, a packaged data source, and a packaged flow from Tableau Prep. So for all of these, if you, have, if you are using a extract or a file-based data source in your workbook and you export it as a workbook or flow or data source and you export it as a packaged version, a copy of that data ends up in the packaged file. 
the package file is really just a zip file with everything that that workbook or flow or data source needs, and that includes the data. So you need to be able to keep track of when you've done that. Okay, and then there's caches. So that's another thing uh, where personal data can end up. And this is part of my attempt to have not just blocks of text, so I, it's screenshots of documentation. <laughs> Because a lot of it's like, there are no visuals here. Um, so, however, it's useful screenshots of documentation because there are links on those images to all of that documentation to help you find the documentation um, there. So that's what I did. Um, so Tableau um, server, actually all desktop server and online, um, do what is called caching to help improve performance. And so um, one example of caching is called the data cache. And so what we'll do, or the query cache. And so what we'll do is, let's say um, user A goes and loads up a dashboard and sets the filters in a certain way, and that creates a query on the database and brings that data into Tableau. We'll hold on to that data. So if that user or another user actually configures that dashboard in the same way, we don't necessarily go back to the database every time we serve up the data that's in the cache. And there are ways that you can configure on Tableau server how that cache works. So you can turn it off so that you always go back to the data source, which is you know, potentially the slowest thing to do because it means you're going to hit your, you know, if, you've, if you're using a live data source, you're going to hit your database every time someone you know, opens up a, a, work, or a, a workbook. Um, or you can say, well, set up the timing. So it's like, well, invalidate the cache every 10 minutes or every day or something like that. So that's something that's configurable um, for administrators of Tableau server. Um, and so there are TSM commands, um, configure data cache, uh, for setting up these parameters of how Tableau server caches. There's also something that we do called cache warming. Um, and the documentation, it's called configure workbook performance after a scheduled refresh. Um, what we call this is cache warming. And so what we'll do, and again, you can configure whether we do this or not, is if you have extracts being created on a schedule in Tableau server, after an extract is created, we will go and look at the history of common queries that have been made on that extract in the past by users of the server. And we'll go ahead and make the query of the extract and cache it at that point. And so we'll, we'll warm up the caches. So someone doesn't actually have to open a workbook in order to get data into the cache. We do it for you. And we rank the popularity of queries and so forth to determine how we do that. And this basically means that you know, when you load up the dashboard for the first time after an extract has been refreshed, we serve up data from the cache so the workbook loads really fast. Um, that's why we do that. And that's something else that you can turn off and configure how often you do it and so forth. So that's another place where um, data can end up. Now, whether you, it's important from a legal perspective to know this and do anything about it is super debatable. Um, but I just want to make sure you have the knowledge of, you know, yeah, copies of your personal data end up in places that you might not expect. So user accounts as well, I mentioned, have personal data. So in general, user accounts themselves hold a small amount of data, like an email address, maybe a phone number if someone types that in, um, na someone's name, and so forth. That's the kind of data. But there's also Tableau, uh, both server and online and public, um, keep historical logs of what someone has done on the server. And those logs are, and audit trails are stored in a variety of places. Um, there's an internal server or internal database, uh, Postgres database that we store stuff into um, to keep track of what people have done, you know, for debugging purposes or auditing purposes or something. Um, and then there are also plain file uh, logs as well um, that can be turned on and so forth. And this is configurable uh, on Tableau server, so you can set up um, how Often these historical records are thrown away. Um, you can say don't log anything at all, um, so you have no record of someone's activities on the server. Um, and you know you may set them up. So like for example, if you're working in a, um, a HIPAA covered entity, 
and you're dealing with patient health data, you need to keep an audit record of who has seen that data. That's one of the requirements of the law. Um, and so you might keep this, these records around for a long time, or you may not care and just throw them away. But this is a record of someone's interactions on a server, um, and that qualifies as personal data. Okay, so that's kind of the first thing, um, is about identifying where all it is. So we've kind of got a list of, you know, you've got your personal data um, that ends up in exports and extracts, your personal data that ends up in packaged files, and then data that ends up in uh, caches within Tableau. So securing the data. So again, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, this is really the thing I think most people should be worried about, is a data breach. Um, that's the thing that's going to get the big fines, the big, you know, big public things that look really bad for your companies um, if personal data gets out there. And so um, there are a number of best practices um, that we have documented about how to secure Tableau Server. Um, so there's a white paper, there's a link on this image um, about Tableau Server security, which talks about all of the different aspects of security. Um, so things like authentication of users, how you authenticate to data sources, and so forth. Um, there's a server hardening checklist, which is part of the Tableau Server documentation, that is a set of best practices of how to set up Tableau Server to be secure. Um, and so it includes things like, you know, setting up authentication properly, um, includes things like turning off APIs that you don't use. You know, Tableau Server has a REST API. If, no one, if you're not using it, turn off the REST API um, because it basically reduces the attack area um, of someone hacking your server. We also, this morning, um, talked about encryption at rest. So that's something that we are bringing to Tableau Server and Tableau Online. And that means that if you have an extract that's being stored in server, you can encrypt it with encryption keys that only you have. And you can be stored elsewhere, created and stored somewhere else. And so what that means is if someone hacks your machine and they, yeah, they got their data extract, that extract is encrypted. So they can't really do anything with it. So that's gonna be a security best practice as well is to start turning on encryption at rest. And that'll be available in both server and Tableau online. That's a great question. It does not right now. Yeah, so that's, we've got a whole list. Uh, so the question, sorry, it wasn't clear this morning whether that takes care of the cached files. And the answer is it doesn't. Um, and that is something, we've got a whole list of encryption that we are looking to add going forward. And that's a big one is talking about the caches. And of course, encryption has side effects. It has a bad performance side effect. Um, so, you know, when you start encrypting caches, it's like, oh man, that's kind of defeating the purpose of the cache because you have to encrypt and decrypt every time. And so you might as well just turn off caching at that point, um, perhaps. You have to see. Um, so we also follow security best practices for Tableau Online in terms of how we store data. And we have a white paper that talks about that, um, talks about basically what we do to keep your data secure if you're using Tableau Online. Actually, how many people here are using Tableau Online? Uh, a few, okay. Most everybody's server. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so next is governing access to and use of personal data. So one of the other things you need to do is make sure that only those people who need personal data have access to personal data. In Tableau, there are a few ways to do this. Uh, in Tableau uh, Desktop, there's something called user-based filtering, where you can filter out data from a data source based on which user uh, is actually accessing it. And then um, server and online, of course, both have rich permission settings to make sure that only the right people have access to dashboards and data sources and so forth. Um, and so making sure that you've configured all of this correctly is an important part of your kind of data management that you need to do um, as part of GDPR. And it's probably something you're doing already because I'm sure many people have dashboards that not everybody in the company or organization should see. Um, just as a little side, one of, the, one of the things I think is gonna happen, um, and I know it's happening at Tableau, is I think what's gonna happen is that a lot of companies are just gonna start collecting and storing a lot less personal data as part of this. 
Because if you don't have it, then you don't have to worry about it. And you know, we're doing things like looking at, for example, you know, historical logs of, you know, of Tableau Online to say, you know, do we need to know, you know, it's good for us to know, for example, the path that someone took through our website, because you know, that's how we make the website easier to use. You know, it's pretty common website analytics. But do we need to know who the person actually is? Not really. We just need to know that it was a person. And so I think that that's going to be the kind of thing that companies do is just to say, we're just going to minimize what personal data, because a lot of people collect stuff they don't need to do. That's just, it's like collect everything you can. Um, and then all of a sudden you have all this personal data that now you have to worry about. But if you don't collect it and store it, you're good. That's like the easiest way to be compliant with GDPR is to not have personal data. And so I, th I think that's what people are going to start doing is just dealing a lot less with it and being, it's like, do we need it? And only doing it if you need it. Okay, so let's talk now about facilitating the rights of data subjects. So this is the one, again, these rights are the ones that have, I think, gotten the most press um, with regard to GDPR. Uh, and these are things like, you know, what used to be called the right to be forgotten, um, which is a, that's a great term. <laughs> okay, so there are a number of different rights that data subjects do have, and there are four of them that are relevant to your use of Tableau. And they kind of come in pairs. So the first pair is right of access and right to data portability. And the second is right to rectification and right to erasure. And so what I'm going to talk about now are if someone exercises their right, and by the way, to do that, you have to basically send in writing a request to the company to say, please delete all of my personal data or, or something like that. And by the way, you know, the whole section of the law that describes this is like half a page. And it has like a big clause in there as well. It says, you know, unless the organ, you know, you can request to have the, your data deleted unless the organization has a compelling interest to keep it. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> What's a compelling interest? Um, that'll be interesting to see what, you know, kind of arguments people try to make in court and the EU will go, yeah, that's not a compelling interest. Um, or yeah, that is, that's a legitimate business interest. Um, so that'll be interesting. Um, as a note, you know, since we have, just so you know, since we have a lot of data about you as customers, we have our privacy policy. It's tableau.com slash privacy, where we talk about what we collect and what we do with it. And it also talks about if you happen to be in the EU exercising your rights. And you can write privacy at tableau.com and exercise your rights if you are covered, if you are covered under, the, under the GDPR. Okay. So right of access and right to data portability basically means that someone, a data subject, someone for whom you are holding data can write to you and say, I would like to know what data you have on me. And that's the right to access and the right to data portability is I would like to have that data. I want you to not just tell me what you have, but send me the data and send me the data in a commonly used machine readable form. That's the way the law is written. And so you may or may not use Tableau to serve this kind of request. You know, maybe the better thing for you is to go to your data catalog, if you have one, where you keep track of all of the data assets you have, and go to there, or you know, supposedly keep track of all your data. <laughs> it's a while, it's a mess out there. Um, and maybe that's how you want to service this. But if you want to use Tableau to service these requests, uh, you can do so. Um, and in fact, Tableau may be an actually a really good place to service these requests because maybe your data sources in Tableau pull together lots of different data sources and combine them together, uh, join them together, and it might be a good central, depending on how your data models are set up, it might be a good centralized place for you to have a, an overview of what data you have on someone. And so if you do so, um, the exporting functionality from Tableau can be a great way to give someone uh, data in the type of format it needs to be in. It exports as a CSV file. That qualifies as a commonly used machine-readable format. So, you know, again, whether you use Tableau to service these kinds of, of requests, um, that's up to you. Uh, but here's a way that you could do it. What's more, um, relevant are the right to rectification and right to erasure. 
That's what the right to be forgotten is actually called. Um, and what that means is right to rectification is a data subject has a right to request that you fix errors in their data. And a right to erasure means that they have a right to request that you erase your data, unless you have a legitimate interest to keep it. <laughs> Whatever that is. Okay, so what do you have to do in Tableau if someone makes this sort of request? Because it does apply to you in Tableau. Because you have cop you know, you've got extracts, you've got packaged files, you've got all these copies of this personal data uh, that you may need to go and update. Um, so the three things, you know, this is the three places where data ends up is one, you need to refresh your extracts and re-export your data. Uh, second would be you need to recreate any of the packaged files that you have. And third, you need to clear the caches. And again, I'm going to say it's up to interpretation how far you really need to go. You know, do you really need to clear the caches? I don't know. GDPR didn't say so. It says you need to delete the data, but caches are kind of weird because they, you know, if you don't change the configuration, they delete themselves after a time. Um, you know, the way the law reads is you just need to delete the data after a reasonable amount of time. It's not like it has to be done within a week or something. Um, these caches are also not that accessible. You know, it's hard to figure out where they are and get at the data that's in them. Um, so it would be up to kind of your organizations, like how far you want to go. And I know the, the position we've taken is we go to a reasonable length to do so, to delete data. Um, and we didn't want to, we don't want to go, as a company, we didn't want to go overboard on all of this because it would be extraordinarily expensive to have like a super strict interpretation of GDPR and be like, we're gonna, you know, crawl through every piece of data on any computer on the system and search for this. And it's like, oh my God, I don't know how you even do that. Um, you know, and there's a lot of money to be made for companies to create tools for doing that. And companies are creating tools for doing that. Yeah. So I'm thinking about some package files we have. We do a lot of reporting side work for our school. Okay. And so we do reporting to the federal government. Um, and we save some time in the package workbook mm -hmm. so that we have it if we get additional questions. Yeah. We have that data. Well, if somebody on there who is one of the students that's included there requests to have their data removed, then you regenerate it. You lose what their status was you know, a year or two ago. Yep. So like, I mean, we struggle, like, how far do we go? We have some of these um, couple of workbooks exist on a network drive that's secure, but to try to even find it all. Exactly. It's, it's just daunting. I don't, I don't know how we're ever going to do it. Yeah, so I, I think you had a great example. If, if so it works for a school, if a student who has records now, are you in the EU? Deal with um, EU people? We, are, we have some students who are. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, here's a, this is actually a great example of, you know, would this be considered a legitimate interest? So you've got a student who requests to have their data deleted, but the school has a record that they've attended the school, and that seems like, to me, like something that is legitimately known. You know, a lot of people talk about, like, employee data. So, you know, one of our employees in Germany has a right to request Tableau remove their personal data. Well, what does that mean? It's not like you could ever go to the point of it's like the employee never existed. You know, you've, you've gone through everything and removed all traces of the existence of the employee. That's certainly not, so, that's going to conflict with a lot of other things. And so this is where there's like a lot of ambiguity as to what this means. And I don't have an answer. Um, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. You know, maybe you keep the data that's necessary. <laughs> so de-identifying the data can be, a, can be a solution if you don't need to know who it was. You know, if there's no, in, you know, that's a great, you know, hashing the data or something like that before you store it to where it's just a, you know, a number or a string that you can't tie back to an actual person. That's a great way to do it. I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. You know, do you keep grades, delete names? I, I don't know. And that's, this is the thing that's going to kind of come, because there would be, a, you know, cases will be brought up in Europe. 
And these things will get worked out over time in the courts, basically, which is challenging because it leaves us all not knowing really what we have to do. But that's how these things work. That's how you know, HIPAA was kind of the same way. Um, and it's become much clearer over time what all of the accepted best practices are um, that, that qualifies. So yes? A company? Yes. So uh, that's good. So does a company have a right to ask this? No, it's a person. But sometimes people have personal content information that's tied to specific accounts. If the person has that person has to do this, how is that Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you know, where it's like the company has a relationship with another company, but there's personal data about the employees as part of that. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, again, if you, if you read the law, you understand why you don't know, because it's super high level. You know, it's, it's like, it's a bunch of kind of principles often. You know, it's not, laws don't specify, they don't go into that kind of detail. Um, and that's the kind of thing that, it's tough. It's, uh, you know, I, I don't have any other way to spin it, um, that it's super vague uh, what you have to do. Yes? Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, is it, you know, you're making your best effort. You know, I would imagine in, you know, if your company were bought before, you know, had a case brought against you, um, you know, you're not complying with GDPR, and you actually had a program and you made an effort um, to do something rather than just ignore the whole thing, that's going to matter, at least in terms of the penalties. You know, they may still say that you didn't do it right, but if you took a good faith effort, as a company and tried to do something and tried to do the right thing based on your understanding, I would imagine, again, and this is just me, I would imagine that um, that would, you know, if, if they found that you violated it and there were penalties, that the amount of the penalties would vary based on it. But if you're a company who's just flagrantly violating it, you know, collecting a bunch of personal data and storing it on an open web server somewhere, you know, they'd probably come down pretty hard on you for that. <laughs> so. Okay, so let's talk about how to do some of this stuff. Um, so if you need to update your, ex, uh, your extracts, the best thing to do is, first of all, you need to do a full extract refresh because you can do full refreshes or partial refreshes. Partial refreshes don't delete things, they just add things. Um, full refreshes will recreate the entire thing with all of the new data, any change data, if it was a rectification type thing, or any deleted data, um, if it was, was a, an erase thing. Um, and then, you know, best practice here is just set up regular full extract refreshes and have them scheduled on your server or your online account. So then what you know is, yeah, any data, you know, if any data source that you've hooked up to Tableau and are making extracts from, you change that data source, within some period of time, it will be deleted. And so that's like a good, you know, it's kind of a set it and forget it type thing. It's not something you have to go back and do manually. Um, the new Tableau Prep Conductor, which allows you to schedule Tableau, Frep, Tableau, Tableau Prep Flow runs on server, will be the same way. So if you are basically you know, not just creating an extract, but also you know, doing a bunch of data preparation and joining and everything before creating that extract, schedule that. And then if data changes on the data source, eventually in some period of time, that those changes will flow through to the extracts or exports that you've created from Tableau. Next thing to do is to recreate the packaged files themselves. Um, there's really no automated way to do this. Um, so that's something you just, you know, it's good to keep track of these sorts of things. But then again, you know, this is where it gets tough because people make copies of files and where do those copies live and they get on a thumb drive somewhere and is that, quite, uh, how is it practical to do this? I just don't know. I'm, I'm fascinated to see how this thing is gonna work out over time. And then clear the caches. So a couple caches you can clear. There's a cache on desktop uh, called the Tableau Desktop Query Cache. Uh, there is a, an article um, that will show you how to actually clear this. Basically, you go down into a directory and delete stuff from a directory um, that's stored uh, inside of uh, your OS. 
um, or on, on your system. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, Tableau Server, and this is true for Tableau Online, by default, the caches are invalidated about every week. So, you know, if you just leave it like it is, eventually the caches will be cleared. And so, you know, we don't keep stuff around forever because then your data would be not fresh um, if you were getting it from Tableau. Um, so, you know, my image here, if you change your data on October 1st, the caches will be updated by October 8th, more or less. There are other factors and these sorts of things, but more, more or less. But again, like I mentioned earlier, you can, you can determine how long things are kept in cache in Tableau Server. Um, that's a configurable option, and I had the, the link to, the comp, to that documentation in the previous section. Um, and there is also a way to just go through and clear the cache manually with a TSM command. So you can just clear the caches and flush them out. Um, so that's another way you could set up a, you could have a script um, that runs this command that executes so off, every so often to just go in and just hard flush all the caches. That would be another option that you have in Tableau. And then of course, if you're dealing with user accounts and you're worried about personal data that are in you know, the user accounts on your Tableau server installation, for example, um, when you delete a user, the primary stuff from the database is deleted but not everything in the, in the internal repository is deleted. Because again, this is kind of like your, your uh, student example. Um, because you know, a user had certain activity on the server, like maybe put comments in on a visualization. Do you go in and delete all of the comments? Because then that's a record of a conversation that you've lost that might actually be important. So do you have an interest, a legitimate interest in keeping that conversation around and intact? Good question. Um, and so we do offer um, not the ability to go in and delete like people's comments, um, but we do offer the ability to go in and throw away any of the historical logging records. So basically when we're keeping track of a user's activity on the server, um, we do have the ability, there are TSM commands uh, for that. It's TSM cleanup is the command um, that you can go in and it'll flush out the Postgres database. It'll throw away information and logs and so forth. Um, to, to keep that out. But then again, whether you can do that, you know, you're losing records, which may you know, be in conflict with something else like, like HIPAA, which says you need to keep a record of who all has seen protected health information. Um, it may hurt your ability to debug your server if you need to know kind of who was doing what and maybe someone's got a, a bad workbook that they put up there um, that's, you know, eating up server resources and you know, who's using it. And you know, these are the things you have to deal with. And then again, and also for Tableau Online and public, um, we delete these historical logs after a time. I think it's about a month uh, is how long we keep things around. Uh, we do keep th some things around longer for Tableau Online um, because we use that data to understand how people use our products. That's like the best source of telemetry data we have about how people use our products. But Tableau Public is kind of a little bit of a different beast because pretty much everything you do there is meant to be public. Anything you put there is public. You know, don't ever put personal data, by the way, in Tableau Public. I think the, the user agreement says don't do that. You can put your own up there if you want. Um, but everything's basically meant to be public. And uh, we do use that data um, to help make Tableau better. Okay, so that's about it. That's what I've got. Um, this is kind of where we are right now. You know, I hope to give a presentation in a year or two years. It's on this that's like more concrete and can give more concrete advice. Uh, but this is what we've got right now. Um, you know, GDPR is out there. I had a, this is more people than I had yesterday when I did this presentation, so that's good. You're in the know. The rest of the 17,000 people out there, they need to be thinking about this. They're <laughs> we're in the know when we're in this room. Everybody else, ah, they're screwed. Um, so anyway, Thanks for coming. Um, I hope this was informative and useful, at least on a kind of a technical level about where everything kind of ends up in the Tableau platform and things you might need to do um, to, main, to, to fulfill your responsibilities under, under GDPR. Again, like I said, I hope this will become, I anticipate and hope this will become clearer over time so we have better answers to these sorts of questions. Uh, and I can talk about it in the future and have, you know, Fewer responses that are, I don't know, no one knows. <laughs> um, 
There, uh, there are a bunch of resources in this deck, uh, links to all of the documentation, links to the law, uh, best practices, server hardening checklist, and all of this um, for you. Remember, there are links in all of the images um, to the documentation and white papers and so forth. Um, and then finally, this is the second rep repetition of it, um, make sure to complete your evaluation. Super helpful for me and for us to know what you all think of this content and my presentation. Um, it helps us uh, get better and it also helps us determine how to schedule things uh, at next year's TC when we see kind of what people are interested in, what, what people thought. So thank you very much and I'll be around uh, 10 minutes or so for questions. And any, any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. But what about the thousands of workbooks that are on that server that may potentially have personal information? Yeah. What do you do about that? It's a great question. Right now, there's no real good tools for that. You know, I know that there used to be a, I can't remember what it was called, but it was like a workbook crawler um, that one of our people created and posted to the Tableau forums. Um, I originally had a reference to that in the presentation. It would basically go through and tell you what the names of all the You could point it at like a directory of workbooks and it would tell you what all the fields that were used. And so you could you know, at least look through and look for comp, you know, field names that were obviously personal data. Um, I tried to use it and it's, it's just not, it's not maintained and not working. So I, I didn't want to recommend it. Um, yeah, um, but as I mentioned, we are working on things like that um, that will help you keep track of your use of data on your servers. So um, this problem will get easier to deal with over time. You know, we are working on things. So, yeah. We had a specific site dedicated to sensitive data. Mm -hmm. So the question is, can you have unique cache settings per site? Uh, I don't think you can. Like, I'm pretty sure you can't. Um, I know that you can have, so you're, you have, can have cache settings per data source. So yeah, so when you set up a data source, um, you can have cache settings for that source. So if you have a particular data source that has the personal data in it, you can have it on a data source level. So that might be helpful. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks for coming, and I hope you have a good rest of your conference and a good time at the party tonight. Thanks.